to our second lecture on the skeletal system. Today we're going to be talking about the microscopic anatomy of bone. So there are four major cell types that make up all bone tissue. They are osteogenic cells, um, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. So osteogenic cells are also known as osteoprogenitor cells. Um, and progenitor just means something that comes before, or something that produces. So these types of cells are actually quite rare in the bone and they're actually stem cells and they give rise to the other three types of cells. Osteoblasts are bone forming cells. Um, so they actually secrete what is called an extracellular matrix. And we'll talk about this in the later part of the video. Um, but they are in contrast to osteoclasts. They rhyme, they look very similar, they actually only differ by one letter. So um, osteoclasts destroy bone. They actually absorb the extracellular matrix and take it up so that the bone can be remodeled and recycled. Both of these cells are very essential to growth. Not just the osteoblasts help promote growth, even though they are the ones that actually secrete the extracellular matrix. Both of them work in concert. And we'll talk about this later um, when we talk about bone remodeling. But just remember that osteoblasts form and osteoclasts destroy. And a useful mnemonic that I use is that they go in alphabetical order. So B and then C, first you make and then you destroy. So. And then the last type of cell is osteocytes. And these actually um, are just regular cells. They make up the majority and they actually differentiate from osteoblasts. So we'll talk about them later when we see some images of compact and spongy bone. So bone is made up of two types of bone tissue. There is compact bone and spongy bone. And you may remember from the gross anatomy video of the long bone that typically compact bone is found on the outside of a bone. So for the long bone, they're found at the very ends and along the sides of the diaphysis, whereas spongy bone is found in the middle of the epiphysis and um, toward the medullary cavity around that area. Um, in other differently shaped bones, that's a similar pattern, even though it doesn't really have the same elongated shape. For example, in flat bones, it looks like a hardened sandwich. So you have both of the outside layers being compact bone, whereas the middle is spongy and it looks like a sandwich. And that kind of structure is actually called diplo. D-I, here I'll spell it out. So that's just a specialized name for um, flat bones and how the compact and spongy bone is distributed. All right, now let's take a closer look at um, the microscopic anatomy of compact and spongy bone in an actual diagram of a bone. So this diagram was taken from the textbook Human Anatomy and Physiology by Elaine Marie and Katja Hoen. Um, it's one of my favorite books. It's really good. So here um, we can see the distribution of compact bone and spongy bone within a long bone. This was similar to what we were talking about in the gross anatomy video. But basically, in this little diagram, you can see that the compact bone is concentrated toward the outer edges of the bone near the periosteum, whereas the spongy bone is near the medullary canal and inside the epiphyses. So let's focus on the compact bone first. Compact bone consists of many, many osteons, also known as haversion systems. So what is an osteon? Well, each of these little tree trunk-like structures, their circles, um, so here's an osteon, here's another osteon. Um, each of these is called a haversion system, and they consist of about 8 to 15 concentric lamellae. Lamellae are formed of extracellular matrix, or ECM, and that is composed of mostly collagen and the organic and inorganic components that we will consider in a later part of this lecture. But, um, so yeah, the lamellae are all concentric, which means that they surround a common center, and the center is called a central or haversion canal. The canal contains um, a nerve, a vein, and an artery, as you can see in this blown up diagram right here. Um, this bundle of three is very important, and the artery is actually a branch of the nutrient artery that penetrates the long bone toward the center. And the artery is responsible for supplying blood and nutrients to the bone tissue. So if we take a closer look at this blown up picture, um, you can see that in between each of the lamellae, so the lamellae would be the lighter um, stripes here, the layers, I'll color them in here purple. So that's a cross section of a lamella. Um, in between these are little holes called lacunae. So lamellae and lacunae, the words kind of sound similar, um, just kind of get used to it. 
So the lacunae are the little holes you can see here in the actual microscopic diagrams. And inside the lacunae reside osteocytes. So these are the types of cells that we were talking about earlier that make up the majority of bone tissue. And they're responsible for maintaining the extracellular matrix. Osteocytes are actually what are called stellate shaped, which means they kind of look like stars. They have little spindle-like extensions that go into tiny canals called canaliculi. And that's the plural form of canaliculus, which literally just means tiny little canals. So what these canaliculi actually enable these cells to do because they extend between lacunae and connect the osteocytes is they allow them to communicate, to exchange wastes and nutrients when necessary. And the osteocytes don't actually divide. Um, they arise from osteoblasts, but basically they just maintain the bony matrix and they can live in these little lacunae for a really long time, sometimes up to 25 years or as long as the organism itself. So here, um, let's take a look at this side of the diagram. The osteons are not actually isolated from one another. Um, they can communicate by way of perforating or Volkmann's canals. So if we look at the osteons, this might be pretty intuitive, I think, but they run parallel to the length of the long bone. So the long bone kind of goes into the page and so do each of the osteons. That's each of these long canals over here but they are connected by um, little perforating canals which are perpendicular to the long axis of the bone. So here's one right here, here's one right here, and um, this is so that the arteries can have alternate paths to, um, to supply blood in case one of them gets blocked or damaged or something like that. So we have an alternate source of blood. And lining the bony canals and covering the trabeculae in the sp uh, spongy bone is endosteum. And we talked about this briefly when discussing the medullary cavity. But this kind of like golden brownish tissue, I'm not sure if you can see it very clearly, but that is actually the endosteum. That's um, just really thin, fine connective tissue. So the spongy bone looks very irregular compared to these um, compact bone, which are these nice concentric lamellae. Spongy bone consists of trabeculae, um, and that's each of these little branch-like structures. Actually, on the surface, they look really messy, but on the inside, they are also composed of concentric lamellae that form these little branch-like structures. So the bone as a whole is covered by periosteum, which is dense, irregular connective tissue, and the periosteum connects to the actual bone by way of perforating or sharpies fibers. So make sure not to get these two confused, the perforating fibers and the perforating canals. The perforating canals contain blood, whereas the perforating fibers are just collagen fibers connecting the periosteum to the main body of the bone. The part of the bone that the perforating fibers connect to are actually called circumferential lamellae. So you can see here that not all of the compact bone is made up of osteons. You certainly do have these osteons, but then what about these spaces in between and these spaces on the very outside? Well, the spaces on the very outside consist of lamellae called circumferential lamellae, and that's because they run around the entire circumference of the bone. They don't just surround one single central canal, but rather the entire circumference of the bone, and they are what attach to the perforating fibers. On the other hand, the lamellae in between the osteons, because they are circles and they don't exactly tessellate perfectly, so these little spaces in between here and here, for instance, um, and perhaps up here, these are called interstitial lamellae. So the word interstitial, like an interstitial fluid, um, that just means in between things. So they're in between the osteons, and they're just little sheets of bone that fill up the spaces in between there. Okay, so here's a very similar diagram. It shows very similar things, but I just want to kind of reiterate some points. You can see each of these little tree trunk-like structures is an osteon composed of concentric lamellae. Here's a very blown up image. You can see the stellate osteocytes with these little projections that extend into canaliculi, which is a plural form of canaliculus. The central or haversian canal in the middle um, that the lamellae surround I don't really like this picture that much, and that's why I didn't show it to you at first, because um, it doesn't show the vein and the nerve that also accompany the arteries. In each of these canals, they seem to only show um, the artery, but in fact, there would be a vein and a nerve in each of these as well. 
you can see the perforating or Volkmann's canals that go horizontally, um, and the spongy bone over here, which consists of trabeculae. Okay, one final thing that I'd like to note about osteons is that the direction of the collagen fibers in each of the lamellae is actually pretty significant. On the left side of the image here, um, we see a pretty familiar image. We know this is an osteon cross-section so that we can see the central canal with the artery and vein, and there would also be a nerve in there as well, um, the concentric lamellae. And um, it's lined by the endosteum on the inside of the canal, as well as on in each of the little canaliculi in between here and the lacunae in which the osteocytes, shown in red, reside. On the right side of the image here, we see the orientation of collagen fibers in adjacent lamellae. So I did mention earlier that the lamellae consist of extracellular matrix and collagen fibers. But here you can see a really clear image that the collagen fiber orientation alternates. So the collagen fibers don't actually run parallel or perpendicular to the main axis of the bone. They're actually um, sort of oblique. They're kind of um, forming a helix structure and in this particular concentric lamella, in this layer, um, it forms kind of a left-handed helix, whereas in this one, um, slightly outside, it forms a right-handed helix, and this one, it forms another left-handed helix. So you see this alternating structure of the collagen fibers, and that's really significant because that allows the bone to have more tensile strength in dealing with torsion or twisting forces. This is just like a really strong rope with multiple strands that uh, wind themselves in different directions. By having all of these collagen fibers that move in different, or that wind around the bone in different directions, the bone can withstand twisting forces more effectively. Now that we've gotten a closer look at compact and spongy bone structure, let's talk about the chemical composition of bone. So bone is made up of two major components, the organic and the inorganic components. And they have different roles in the interplay a lot, so we'll see how that plays out. So the organic portion of bone forms 35% of the bone by mass. And it consists of the four solid types that we considered at the beginning of the lesson, and um, something called osteoid, which forms about one-third of the extracellular matrix in bone. Osteoid is formed of two components, ground substance and collagen fibers. Ground substance is composed of proteoglycans and glycoproteins, that just means protein chains attached to carbohydrate chains, and collagen fibers are um, really prevalent in the human body, and they just provide a lot of great tensile strength. So all in all, the organic components of the bone matrix um, enable bone to resist tension. And tension is just pulling forces. So when your muscles pull on different ends of the bone in order to create movement, they create tension on the bone and that resists that type of force. In contrast, the organic component, or sorry, the inorganic component of bone is composed of hydroxyapatites, or mineral salts. And the large majority of the mineral salts in bone are calcium phosphate crystals. And these crystals are actually in the form of tiny little needle-like structures that fit in between the collagen fibers of the organic component of bone. So they're not in different physical, geographically separate realms. They're actually interwoven in between each other, and this complex interplay allows them to resist both compression and tension forces. So while tension is pulling, compression would be pushing on both sides, and your bones experience a lot of compression, like from gravity and from all your other tissues pushing in on the bone. And um, the mineral salts give the bone its hardness that we tend to think of when we think of bone. All in all, bone is really tough and really durable and really strong. It is actually about half as strong as steel in resisting compression and the same strength as steel in resisting tension. And we owe that to the inorganic and organic components of bone. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you had a great time. Leave any comments or questions in the comments down below and see you next time. Bye!